All right, hello everyone. My name is Adora. I am one of the partners at Y Combinator. I have Raham from AppDevGo, Alana from Bulletin, and Tiffany from The Human Utility. So today, today we're going to talk about, our discussion will be around essential startup advice. Um, so I think there's a lot of actually good advice in books, articles, and even on Twitter sometimes. Um, but they tend to be, I think, very generic and abstract in uh, an attempt to try to, to make it apply to everybody as much as possible. So today I want to go over some of that common advice you probably see and dive deep, one level deeper, into how it applies to um, these three folks and their startups uh, and go from there. So the most common advice I hear all the time and I give all the time is make something people want. It's so common that's almost the motto of Y Combinator. Um, so maybe you guys can start off with introducing yourselves and what's the one-liner for what you're building and how did you know or why did you think it was something people wanted? Um, hi everyone, I'm Raham Figiri, co-founder and CEO of AppDeco. Uh, we are a marketplace for buying and selling furniture based here in New York City. So if you're selling furniture, definitely check out AppDeco. Uh, have to plug all the time. Um, so the reason why I started AppDeco was actually out of my own frustration, trying to sell furniture on Craigslist. Had a really bad experience, uh, realized that there are something has to be done to make it better and more efficient. So we are a one-stop solution. We take care of the pickup and delivery. We handle payments online. We verify everything before pickup. And that was the reason why we started it, is because out of my own frustration. Great. Hi, guys. I'm Alana Branston, co-founder and CEO of Bulletin. Uh, Bulletin is we work for retail space. So we build uh, physical retail stores where direct-to-consumer brands can sell their products uh, for a monthly membership fee. Uh, so we have two stores here in New York. Uh, the stores are actually filled with all female-led brands. So um, yeah, it's completely for women by women. Um, and yeah, when we started the business, we actually did not build something that people wanted at all. Like it was a disaster. Um, <laughs> We started off with, uh, it was basically like an Etsy competitor. It was like a cool curated Etsy was the idea. Um, we like literally didn't sell anything. It didn't work. Um, and then we started talking to those users and basically asked them, okay, like what can we do that is helpful? Because this clearly is not. And figured out that they wanted access to retail space and how hard it was for them to get into stores. Um, so yeah, we eventually built something people wanted. It just <laughs> took a while. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Tiffany Ashley Bell. I am the founder and executive director of a not-for-profit organization called The Human Utility, where we essentially pay water bills for people that can't afford their own. Um, we've done that for like a thousand families in Detroit and Baltimore and a bunch of surrounding cities since, oh. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's not really we either, it's all you guys have donated. Um, but you know, we've done that for a thousand families uh, since we started in July 2014. And, it was more of make something people need. Um, so we essentially crowdfund the money to help people. Um, and I just read one day, I'm not from Detroit or anything like that, I just read about what was happening in Detroit, because I was actually working in City Hall in Atlanta, and I was just thinking to myself, like, what kinds of failures had to happen in City Hall where somebody just decided that if you're poor, we'll turn your water off. And I thought that was pretty crappy. So um, friends and I got together and just decided to, like, you know, we'll, we'll throw away 100 bucks in a, in a weekend on some shirt we don't need in a bad restaurant. So why not give that to, you know, people to help with their water bills? But it turned into, like, the whole Internet wanting to do that. So I've been doing that ever since. So. Awesome. Um, okay, so another piece of advice is do things that don't scale. So give us one example of something that you did that wasn't really scalable, but you had to do it anyway. Um, and maybe it's related to how you got your first user. I have a lot. Um, <laughs> but um, so when we first started, um, I don't know how many people are doing marketplaces, but the big problem with marketplaces, this, they call it the chicken and egg problem, is you need to get you know, content and also buyers. And so how do we convince people to actually transact on our, on our platform? So um, how do I get furniture on the platform when nobody will trust that I actually am a real legitimate business was the question that we were trying to tackle. So um, we were going on Craigslist. Um, the reason why I actually built the platform was because of Craigslist, but we were going on Craigslist just telling people, hey, you should try AppDeco. You know, we are gonna take care of delivery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some people, you know, were convinced enough to list, but um, the part that actually came out of one of my partner meetings at YC was, instead of having people 
you email them and have them go list on your website. Why don't you just list it for them? And so that was like, oh, wow, is that even kosher? I mean, I don't think it is. But um, so we just started just going on Craigslist and literally just copying content from Craigslist to our site. And then there's a whole other story of like once something's sold, how did we get it to the customer? That's a whole different story. Um, yeah, for us, we basically when we were pivoting from this like Etsy competitor idea to the, the retail space idea, um, we really didn't have any money. I think we had 20K that we had gotten from YC Fellowship. Um, and we're like, okay, how are we going to test like a retail space concept? Uh, and so my co founder and I, it was just the two of us at the time, started doing these like outdoor weekend flea markets as a way to test the concept. Um, so we literally rented out this like overgrown vacant parking lot in Williamsburg. It was like a toxic wasteland. <laughs> and we had all these brands come. We'd have like 40 brands come every weekend and they would come and like set up their product and sell. And like it actually went really well where like they were making a lot of money. We were making money finally. Um, and we used that to basically prove that like, okay, brands will show up and pay for space and like there's definitely better ways to do this. Um, and yeah, it was completely unscalable, but it did like prove our point, which is good. So um, we have kind of a two-sided thing where we have donors and then the people that actually need the help. Um, and so if you follow me on Twitter, I'm sorry, but that's like the, uh, the, the way that we got the initial donors. But um, we had all this money that kind of piled up as far as uh, pledges go. And um, since we'd done everything on social media, we didn't know how to access or like get to the people that needed the actual money. Um, but what ended up happening is just like we got really low tech and we just like designed some postcards and sent them to people. Um, and so like if you, the USPS has like a way where you can just like target certain blocks and just kind of like uh, say you want to send, you know, 500 postcards to this street and it's like kind of gerrymandered the way it looks like. Um, but like we ended up just kind of doing that and just kind of going from our database and just saying we have a lot of people from Detroit in this zip code that are applying, so why not just target that entire zip code? And we just started doing that kind of thing. So these people were not on social media, so we couldn't just keep tweeting for them. Um, and actually, maybe I'll talk about it later, but the city wasn't helping us either, because they were kind of like, who the hell are you? So they were just, you know, we didn't get help in that way. So we kind of had to like just hack it in that way. And it turned out to be a really interesting sort of thing to send out postcards. So. Um, so the next one is find 10 to 100 customers that really love your product. Um, so how did you determine that people are loving your product? Like how did you define that either qualitative or, or quantitatively? Um, so I'll continue along the same story. Um, so for us, once we started you know, listing these products from Craigslist and trying to, um, we got our first sale and we're like, wow, okay, what are we going to do to actually fulfill the sale? Because these sellers don't even know that we've listed their product on our platform. Um, so uh, we were trying to figure out how to fulfill that order. So, you know, the first time I tried, I'd email, hi, I'm the CEO of AppDeco. You know, we sold your product on AppDeco and, you know, we're going to pay you and it just didn't work. They, nobody responded. Um, so then we just realized, like, hey, like, why don't we just actually just pretend like we're a Craigslist shopper, go on their platform, uh, go and just email them, like, hey, I'm gonna buy it, and we just pay them in cash. And that's what we did. Um, the most amazing thing that happened out of that is because we were actually visiting every person's home, we were talking to our customers, and we realized once we told them why we started the business, because once we got to their home, we would tell them, hey, this is, by the way, AppDeco, and this is what we do, et cetera. Um, they were like, wow, this is amazing. They actually started telling all their friends. So every time we went and we were doing something very unscalable, five, ten people signed up as a result of it. So that was the genesis of sort of getting from, you know, ten to a hundred customers. Referrals, basically. Pretty That's much, great. exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I feel like we have like a pretty similar experience where once we started getting referrals from brands, we felt like, okay, like we're doing something good enough that people are recommending their friends. Um, I think we got lucky because our, our users, they're in this tight-knit community of brands, and so they all would talk to each other. And if someone sold in our store for a few months and they were making good money, like they're going to tell someone else in their community. Um, and yeah, I think it was like when we opened the third store and we just were able to like book it out immediately and we like couldn't believe that people were paying like pretty healthy rates to sell in the store. Um, and yeah, it was just like finally getting to a point where we were doing something right for the users. 
Yeah, I mean, so the first tips, like, again, from donors versus people that we're helping. Um, so the donor side was, again, just social media, and it turned into, like, the news finding out about us and then people signing up from there. And that became, like, me getting stuck in my apartment for, like, two weeks talking to press over and over again about what we were doing. Because it was kind of weird, if you think about it, to pay somebody else's water bill. So people were kind of fascinated with that aspect. Um, but then as far as the people we helped, again, is the postcards, but then, like, you know, Facebook groups and stuff like that. So... So let's talk a little bit about competitors. So the common advice is just ignore it. You're going, your startup, you know, startups are going to die because of suicide, not murder. Um, so how do you guys think about competitors? Uh, it's definitely, it's easier said than done to ignore them for sure. But, um, you know, I've learned through time now where this is our fifth year in businesses, that is really the best advice is to try to ignore them. And uh, what I've learned over time is, you know, just focus on the things you can control. Um, and you can control make delighting your customers. You can control making, you know, a product that people want and things of like things of that nature. We've had competitors that have raised, you know, tons more money than we have to date even, and they've shut down. So it doesn't really matter at the end. It's all about the execution and just focus on the things that will make you, um, uh, you know, compete in the market. Yeah, I think we try and ignore them as much as possible also. Um, I definitely have like my Google alert set to see like if when they announce certain things and I think, you know, we'll look to see how they're positioning their product in the market or when they're raising money. Um, but yeah, I think like the more you can just keep your blinders on and look at your metrics and look at your milestones and keep your team looking at that and not be like, oh my God, they just raised $23 million. Like, what are we gonna do? Um, it's, it's, it's distracting and it doesn't really help you in any way. Yeah, so the not-for-profit sector is a little different. Um, <laughs> because there's, there's still totally competition. Like, it's not just this, like, oh, everybody's, like, trying to help the world or whatever. Because it's actually surprisingly cutthroat, which I learned kind of on the job. Um, maybe if you pull me afterwards, I'll tell you about certain mafia-esque phone calls I got from other organizations. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> but, like, um, just for us, it's been like learning how to like communicate the work that we're doing really well, um, and also just kind of pulling at people's heartstrings and like learning how to do the storytelling. Um, and then also, um, you, you mentioned you butted heads with the cities a little bit. Can you? So what's that? You, but, you butted heads with the cities a little bit, or they yeah. weren't helpful at all. No. Maybe. So I think when we launched, we embarrassed Detroit, which wasn't the which wasn't the goal. We just helped people when they didn't, um, and so they they didn't. I mean, it's true. It's true. So they they told people not to come to us for help because they're like, well, you know, if you need help, come to us. But they weren't helping people. Um, they were turning off cancer patients for crying out loud, and this is the kind of stuff that was going on. Um, but we got a call from a certain very big nonprofit, it's a national organization, and they saw us as competition, which was funny because I was still like operating this out of my bedroom basically as a fundraising thing. But it's just the principle that you know we got more press, people were this what we were doing was resonating with people more, and we could show actual like success stories, and we weren't like building six houses with hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and that kind of thing. So I think that's, the nonprofit sector has competition still, but I think if you like, show that you operate better, you're actually using the money for what you say you are, and you're like, putting those success stories out, and then you're talking about like, the systemic change that you're trying to actually uh, kick off, that actually resonates with people. Um, because that's the question I get all the time, too. Like, how are you going to do this? Like, what's the long-term sort of plan? And for us, it's actually not to keep raising money, but it's actually to, like, have laws passed around water affordability and just kind of use, like, a lot of startup-esque principles to, to do that. So, Cool. Uh, so it's often said that you shouldn't uh, start scaling, as in hiring lots of people until you find product market fit. Um, so... Maybe can you, we kind of went over, we talked about referrals and stuff like that, but maybe you can go over, when did you know you should hire your first person? Who, who was your first important hire and why did you hire that person? 
product market fit for us um, was when we decided to take on delivery and make it in-house. Um, so when we started the business, we did not want to touch the furniture. We just wanted to provide the platform. A year and so into it, um, we were working with third-party moving companies. We realized that it's just the quality of service was not up to par, and they were just canceling jobs on us last minute. So we hired some guys off of Gregs again and, uh, and rented as a van. And that day, you know, we had incredible feedback from customers. Fast forward, you know, now we have over 10 trucks in the city. And what we saw was as soon as we brought delivery in-house, um, you know, we talked about referral, but really it skyrocketed. Um, the type of referrals, um, the quality of service as well, the branding, um, also our metrics. We now understand our metrics very well. Um, and that, that was really the, the basis for it. I mean, our first hire was customer service because it was all about delighting customers. And what I learned over time is, you know, your needs as a business change over time. So our first hire was customer service, and that was at the time the most important hire. Um, we fast forwarded a couple of years later, our head of operations and obviously our engineers, et cetera. Yeah, for us, it took us about a year and a half before we got to product market fit. Like we pivoted so many times and just kept taking like the little things we'd learn and use it for like the next version of the company we'd run. Um, but yeah, it literally wasn't a year and a half until we got to a point where we were opening retail stores, they were working, the brands were happy. Um, and then to answer your question about the, the hiring, I think our first important hire is really what got us to like full product market fit in my mind. Um, there was basically a point where we were treating the stores as like the store, stores as a service, like any brand can come and sell their product. And so we ended up with this like crazy store where there is like Fitbit competitors next to blankets and it just didn't make sense, obviously. <laughs> um, and so we hired um, our director of product, Maggie Brain. She came from J. Crew, who just totally transformed the business. She's a merchandiser. And so she was able to really pick the right brands, pick the right products and price point and I mean, the stores just took off after that, but it was like that final key hire before we were like, okay, like we can scale this, we're good. Yeah, for us, product market fit is just like having people continue to support us basically. So we've been trying to build a stronger recurring giving program. So that's still kind of in the works actually, because like I had never run a nonprofit before, so I didn't know like what we should actually be doing and like what that looks like as far as success besides like changing laws. So we're still doing that. Um, but as far as like the first hire we had, it was also customer service because like, you know, we had all these people that were applying for help that like, I couldn't talk to them all on my own. Um, we talk about stuff that didn't scale. I was turning into kind of like a social worker slash therapist by like talking to everybody who, like seriously, like who, everybody who applied, I talked to them on the phone for at least 30 minutes, um, which was good in the beginning because like people were feeling heard for once because when you deal with a lot of people that are in poverty, the thing that's, common amongst all of them is they, they get overlooked and ignored. Um, and so we just kind of, I just listen to people more. But um, Kate, who used to direct uh, nonprofits at YC, she kept telling me, like, you need to hire somebody because you're looking worse and worse the, every time I see you. And you can't, like, you know, you can't do this on your own and, and like, whatnot. So I actually, um, the spring of 2016, I'm an engineer, by the way, too. So, like, I took, like, a month off from everything else and just built out what became our case management system. And then that allowed me to actually hire the customer service person because they would have had the no rails otherwise because all we had was the rails console. Um, but that was our first customer. I mean, that was our first hire. Cool. Semi-related to that is when, when founders come into YC, we, we say, please, please remember to get some sleep and some exercise. So how do you guys stay sane <laughs> while running a startup? <laughs> yeah. Or do you? Still, still trying to figure that one out. Um, yeah, so this year, at least, I'm trying to make it to the gym more and travel. Um, it's still work in progress, but definitely, it's very, very important. And what I learned over time is, you know, it's not about the number of hours. It's more about how productive you are. You can work six hours and be more productive than working 15 hours in a day. So um, I'm trying to still implement that, but it's, yeah, it's very, very important. Yeah, I think for us, I mean, it's something where it ebbs and flows. Like, there's there's weeks where things are just completely insane, and we're opening a new store, and I just feel, like, very unhealthy and not okay. Um, and I think the whole team gets that way sometimes. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think tr when we do have, like, kind of a down moment, like, trying just to really take advantage of it and just, you know, not go into the office on the weekend, 
Um, running has really helped me. I know like a lot of people hate running. I used to, but for like just my mental state, like running has done wonders for me. Um, so yeah, I know people hate it, but maybe try it. <laughs> I mean, I, so this is actually the end of my vacation this week. Um, I was on, like, literally, I was on vacation this entire week, um, which never happens. Um, but the three things that I've been doing more is, like, going to therapy. Um, I work with an executive coach that helps me, like, stay organized and prioritize and things like that. And then, like, something I started in the last couple months is acupuncture, because um, it's helped with, like, energy issues and, like, actually getting me to sit down somewhere, like, during the business day. So... Those are really, really quick things. Um, I know we're over time, but I, I apologize, but I want to add in one more question because I think it's so important, and that is, um, the advice is founder relationships matter more than you think. Um, so can you talk about your relationship with your co-founder and how do you guys stay sane with each other and balance things? Um, so for us, uh, I have a co-founder, and uh, so my background, I'm an engineer, and he um, came from marketing and sales. So um, early on, we tried to create delineation of roles, and you know, we butt heads still all the time. But at the end of the day, someone has to make the final decision because it's if it was always a democracy, and we both have to come consensus. We're just never going to um, move forward, move quickly. So what we do is, you know, any product-related things, I I essentially have the final say. Any marketing related things, he has the final say. For example, we run subway campaigns. I really did not want to spend the money. And he was like, well, we're going to do it. And we did, and actually it worked out to be very well. But you know, I think this is the important thing, is creating that sort of, making sure that you have a structure where you're able to make decisions fast and quickly. And conflict's OK, but you have to figure out a healthy way to manage it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like I just got so lucky with my co-founder, Ali. Like, we have very complementary and different like skill sets and personalities like I'm more introverted I like to kind of manage things from behind the scenes she is like the total opposite she's like highly extroverted amazing salesperson amazing press person um, and so we work really well together and I think for, even from the very beginning when it was just the two of us like working in my apartment um, we just could kind of like stay in our own lanes. Like I just knew what I was good at and what she was good at. Um, and yeah, we just, we worked really well together. Uh, and so yeah, I think when you're looking for your co-founder, even if it's not like she's the technical one, I'm the non-technical one, like I don't think it needs to be like that, but just looking at like different personality types and even soft skill sets, it really helps to have a little bit of a mix there, I think. So my original co-founder couldn't go through YC with me, but she's like a very dedicated donor and advisor of the organization. But the next person I think of that has been around just as long technically is my, uh, the customer service person I hired, Marie. Um, she's, I, I'm the fundraiser and the person that like does all the technical stuff, but she does the customer service, which again, I burnt out on. But another thing that she's really good with is people. Like I, I still labor under the belief that this is ridiculous, I have to do this as an organization, but she is just kind of like, you know, okay, I'll call the city people and talk to them for you, because I'm on the phone like, why the hell can't you do this, or whatever, and she's patient enough to be like, you know, um, I will talk to them, I will make this work for us, or whatnot, and she's way better at that stuff than I am, because I'm just like, to me, common sense, this shouldn't have to be a thing, but she's able to talk to people and kind of finesse them and whatnot, so. I really like, appreciate that aspect of the work that she does. Cool, awesome. Well, that's it. Um, if you can give these three a round of applause. Thank you so much.